Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Jane Friedman. Hi Jane! Hello Joanna. It's great to have you back on the show. Now just as an introduction, Jane has spent more than 15 years in the media industry as an editor, publisher and professor. She's currently the web editor of the Virginia Quarterly Review based at the University of Virginia where she also teaches digital publishing and online writing. She's also the editor of Scratch Magazine, which focuses on writing and money and life, which we are focusing on today. Jane, you're just, you're, you're everywhere at the moment, and I was saying, does that about cover your background? Yeah, that's a great, great high-level summary. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you, you do... You, you're sort of a big figure, I think, in the in the publishing community these days. So I'm really thrilled to have you on the show. So I wanted to sort of start off. Um, I I actually get quite a lot of personal criticism for my own focus on the business of being an author. Um, you know, some people think if you talk about business, then you must not care so much about the craft or the language. Um, and they and people think art and business can't go together. So why do you think there's such an issue with money and art? And why did you start Scratch because of this? Yeah, yeah, I would say it's, it's interesting. We're starting with this question because I just spoke on it at a conference over the weekend um, about the historical perspectives on money and art um, or, and business and writing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did a really deep dive into some of our cultural attitudes towards art and business. And our thinking on this issue goes back a few hundred years. Um, so it's kind of like there's this like ingrained idea in the culture that the two things um, are antithetical to each other. And that idea was invented. It was invented by someone who was frustrated with his sales and felt like the only way to rescue his art was to say that it was superior because that it, it didn't sell. <laughs> um, so like, and we've had that idea ever since this myth of the starving artist that to, you know, keep our art pristine and to preserve this, this value to it that we can't pay attention to the marketplace. And um, what I recently read a book by Elizabeth Hyde Stevens. Um, she did this book called Make Art, Make Money, which focuses on some of the lessons we can learn coming out of Jim Henson's life, the great um, artist and puppeteer, and how he you know, balanced these two sides and didn't see them as opposed, that he saw how to make business serve art and how you know he could use it as a way to to fulfill his artistic vision. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that he was um, pandering or selling out, um, but he he knew how to use the system to his own purposes. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's horrible that any writer or artist should be criticized for operating in the realities of the marketplace. I mean, certainly. Um, there are people who, who do totally pander and, you know, everyone has to make certain sacrifices to go to the next level. Um, but it totally ignoring um, the interrelation of these two things and how art has often thrived because of the support of business and patrons or sales. I mean, this is, this has been a relationship that goes back for a very long time and it doesn't, art can't operate in a vacuum. I'm not sure why we ever thought it could, um, or that it should, or that it was somehow superior for it to do mm. so. Um, I think the tension that results is actually quite healthy. You know, we need a little bit of a, of that, uh, fence, mm. a little bit of that, um, challenge to, to, you know, push us to do better, to go further, to think creatively. So I see it, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, it strikes me that sometimes when I talk about these issues, I, I don't want to sound like strident. Like I don't take it really, really seriously. Like I'm sincere about advocating that writers think about the art and the business as something that um, can successfully play together. Um, but I'm not like saying you're wrong if you can't be a business person. It's, 
it's more about being open to the possibility that these things can work together. Mm. Well, for me, I've, I feel very passionate. I, I have a lot of young women in my life, my nieces and my, you know, and, and my goddaughter. And they're being, they're at the stage where they're being told, you know, you have to get, you have to do the certain courses so you can get a proper job. And I feel like one of my driving forces is I want to prove that being an artist, being a creative and a writer is a, in quotes, proper job that parents can feel happy that their children go into but in order to do that you have to be able to pay your bills right yes yes you do and you know a lot of people want to know at what point can I like just focus on the writing or not have to worry about the day job or kind of let go of some of the realities of life and that's a very hard question to answer because I think it's so personality driven and what kind of sacrifices you're able to make some of your personal circumstances. If you have family members to support and take care of, there are so many factors that play into the decision and, and what um, kind of stamina you have and your acceptance of risk. Mm -hmm. I think it's definitely possible to be an artist and an entrepreneur and to um, not have the so-called day job, but there's also quite a bit of work and persistence that goes into reaching the level where you where you feel a little bit, let's say, I don't want to say comfortable exactly, but you don't feel like anxious all the time about where the next paycheck's going to come from. Mm. So um, risk tolerance is really important, as well as just having some patience um, for what work you are putting into the whole process to, to pay off. I think sometimes this is the difficulty that every writer faces is they want results now, or or financially, they need to have the results now. Mm-hmm. And I've found over and over again, it's not something you can necessarily force. It's not at your command. Um, and you and there's there's quite a bit of faith that goes into it. In fact, the last issue of Scratch, my my magazine on on writing and money, that the theme is faith. The faith that the work that you put in is actually going to pay off in the long run, financially or otherwise. Yeah, that's exactly right. And one of the things I did when I was going to give up my job, which I did uh, nearly three years ago now, is I we sold everything. We completely downsized our life. We sold our house, so we don't have any debt. We sold. We don't yeah. have a car. You know, we completely right. downsized, and that really took the pressure off. Yeah, which meant exactly. That I could earn less money, and I do earn significantly less money now. Yeah. But I'm so much happier. <laughs> right, exactly. So there are trade-offs that yeah. you've made, the, the so-called sacrifices. Mm-hmm. And um, everyone has to look at their own lifestyle requirements and, and see what what's really possible. Yeah. And it was really interesting. Again, in, in Scratch, you interviewed, uh, well, your your editor partner interviewed Cheryl Strayed, uh, who wrote Wild, b- brilliant book, obviously. Um, and I, I just, uh, I've got a quote here. Um, Writing is a terrible way to make a living when it comes to the t- statistical chances that you will make a living. Um, but if you can make a living at it, there's a sort of poetry to how it works. So I wondered, you know, and, and she talks about her credit card debt and and, and and how a six a multi six figure advance can disappear, um, right. you know, with all the, and it was, it's a brilliant article. But I wondered if you could maybe talk about what are some of the business models that authors can have uh, in this in this new world, I guess. Well, I mean, the traditional old fashioned model is strictly book sales. Mm-hmm. Um, and everyone thinks that there was probably some golden era where authors made a living off of sales. Um, if you look back, that's not necessarily true. Um, even authors like Mark Twain or Charles Dickens, who were quite successful by the standards of the day, often made more money on things like lectures and readings and appearances and serials and things of that nature. Um, so, I mean, part of this depends on the genre or the community that you're in, like if you're a genre writer versus a literary writer. Mm-hmm. But I think, especially on the literary side, the, the prevailing model is teaching and doing things related to educating other writers, um, which has, in fact, become a little more difficult because of the glut of, of MFA students being produced. That's a, a whole other problem that we could talk about. Um, and then on the, like the genre side, there's still that education component, being a teacher. And But I, what I'm seeing that's really interesting is probably on the nonfiction and journalism side, we're seeing subscription and membership models. Um, uh, whether it's a blogger or someone who's running a full-fledged site or community, having some kind of wall where you're paying for access 
or it's kind of like this positive paywall um, where you get a lot of the experience for free, but if you're a really devoted, like, Uber fan, then you're going to have to pay some kind of fee to, like, get community board access or get special privileges or be able to email the person uh, behind the scenes who's running the site. So those are some other interesting ways, uh, more probably applicable to nonfiction. Mm. Um, but certainly, I, I think something that you've participated in lately is very interesting, the, um, the collective, the Deadly Dozen release. And I think there's some really interesting opportunities that haven't fully been explored in how authors can form collectives and do work together to bring a greater audience to everybody. Mm. Um, I'm really interested in, in seeing where that goes and uh, what other models... Well, I think that, you're, sorry, uh, what, what I was thinking in that, the collaboration model is almost the only way to become more scalable. So I'm doing 50-50 right. royalty share with, with translators who are yes. also going to be marketing partners. So I don't have to do any more, you know, writing work. I can help yeah. them with marketing and we both make 50%, which takes one book and exploits the rights. So I see right. that as, like you're saying, collaboration kind of model. Right, exactly. So trying to look at a big picture level, big picture level, there's like the collaboration, there's the, the readers that pay you, there's um, the crowdfunding where readers and other kind of passersby, um, patrons, um, and that patron might be a wealthy person who really believes in what you're doing or um, nonprofits or government agencies. I know, especially in Canada, I don't know if the same is true in the UK, but in Canada, I know there's a very, um, there's more of an environment there where as a writer or artist, you can expect more assistance um, than you can in the United States. Um, so there, there are lots of different ways to go about it. And I think probably at the moment it's best to diversify like I would I would never recommend someone focus on one to the exclusion of all others you kind of have to usually put together a collection of these things especially earlier in your career I think the the longer you stick with it the more uh, freedom you have to say to shut some doors and say I'm only going to focus on this Mm. And I, I tell you what, I think there's some problems that need to be solved. And you, you have these big question blog posts that you <laughs> smart, smart set. That's what you call, yeah. which are great. And one of one of my big questions that I, I want to see happening is, um, you know, like ACX is uh, will do the royalty distribution. That's what's missing in these collaborative deals. So with the Deadly Dozen, yeah. we needed to have somebody else to collect the money and distribute the money. For, you know, with ACX does that. With my translators, I'm, I've am i realized I have to do that and I'm not happy about yeah. it. I actually want to pay an agent or some middle man to do that kind of distribution of royalty for less money than a publisher, basically. <laughs> And, yeah. and I see that as that piece in the puzzle is the thing that's missing to allow more authors to do this. I mean, I would be doing more of this if there was an easier way to split the money. Basically. Right, right. Yeah, I totally hear you, which is why I, I have a lot of interest in the collective idea. Because mm. if they're if because providing the administrative, mm. uh, yeah, the administration behind what you're talking about mm. um, for a, a more reasonable fee than a publisher for sure and maybe even an agent although I wonder if agents aren't going to be more helpful in that as mm. time goes on I guess we'll see mm. but yeah I see that as like a role like the companies starting in that niche I think could do potentially very well just to you know clip the ticket on the way through and manage all of that you know that could mm -hmm. really change things yeah, um, yeah and agree. as you said I think that's starting to happen now um one of the one of the things I guess as well is um that you you know you're aware of many of the people in this space who are doing very well I wonder what do you see as the commonalities um, between authors who are who are making let's say over a hundred thousand US mm -hmm. a year mm -hmm. like like what are those people doing at the moment this is very trend driven I want to point out mm -hmm. um, they tend to be quite prolific um, they're producing a lot of work and I don't mean necessarily books it could also be it could be a combination of books and blog posts and classes and, and social media activity and like they've it's the omnipresent feeling like they're everywhere at once you you wonder how they can produce so much work um, so there there's that I, I think they're also very consistent in what they're producing 
they're very focused on serving a particular readership or community. Um, and they've usually been in it for quite a while because it take, to reach six figures, that's an engine that's taken a long time to build. Um, so unless you're like one of these uh, overnight successes, which I actually don't believe in, yeah. um, you've probably had a run up of a decade or more to that type of income. And I think that also that income entails usually um, a lot of insight into who you're reaching and how, like on a, on a numbers level, like through analytics and a, an in-depth insight into who's buying your stuff and how to get them to buy the next thing, whatever that is. Mm. No, it's, it's great you say that. I, I agree. I think, you know, I met Barbara Freethy at the um, London Book Fair and I think she really struck me because she's just such a kind of nice, quiet, normal lady, you know, or a good, you know, good businesswoman. But the fact is yeah. she has 38 books and she's been writing for 20 years. So, yeah. you know, it, it, and then if you actually do the maths, uh, 38 books, you don't, you only have to sell, you know, 500 or so a month in all, of each of those books and you do make a lot of exactly. money. Exactly. <laughs> so, it, yes. it, and it's so funny because the penny dropped for me. It was like, oh, this is how publishers are so rich. This is why publishing has been a great business. <laughs> it's like, ding! Because <laughs> I don't think you get that perspective when you only have a couple of books, right? You can't That's see true. It. You can't see. And then that once you understand how publishing does make so much money, you know, you can see how you could do it too. <laughs> right, yes. To become almost like a small press. Yeah. Yes, basically. It's so interesting. But I, I wondered, um, you know, so if people, people listen, some people listening will be going, oh, wow, that sounds so exciting. And other people going, oh, my goodness, that's just way, way, way too much for me. You know, how, how do people, if people want to go this route, you know, how do people transition from being an author, say with one or two books, to running a business as mm -hmm. an author? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think you recognize the change once it's time to switch gears. Um, and by that I mean that you suddenly realize that you're turning a profit, <laughs> um, which made, well, for most writers that doesn't happen for quite some time where you're actually, your expenses um, are below what your income is for the writing itself. Mm -hmm. um, when you realize that you have to start saying no, I think that's a major turning point for a lot of people because especially early in your career, you're, you, you want more opportunities and you're also probably trained to say yes, accept everything, get all the exposure you can, write for free, et cetera. And then it, you realize, oh, I can't do that anymore because the number of quality opportunities or the number, the amount of money you can make doing your own thing outweighs the lesser requests or opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also a critical juncture. Um, realizing when you might actually have enough money to hire assistants, mm -hmm. even if that's just um, like a virtual assistant, because you realize that one or two hours of time you have more earning potential in that time than, say, tackling your email inbox. Um, so I think those are signs that you need to start thinking a little more strategically, and you also need to like set up, I hate to say it, like quarterly income and expense spreadsheets, um, and start tracking the growth and being very strategic about, okay, in the last six months, um, I got more money from X than Y. Mm. Why is that? And how am I going to change what I'm going to do in the next six months as a result? Um, I think that sort of strategic thinking is overwhelming and probably too much for the person who write, who, who at the moment may only have one or two books. Like that's, that's like, how will I ever reach that? So I think it's kind of like a one, you have to take it like Anne Lamont says, bird by bird, yeah. <laughs> book by book, step by step. You don't want to try and like, master that um, right out of the gate. I think there's an overwhelming momentum that you reach and you realize, okay, it's time. This is, I need to be smarter with, with how I'm prioritizing my work. Mm. Yeah, I'm going through all of that sort of right now I, I really feel you know at that point and uh and I'm gonna I'm gonna write another book about it I think because you know I think like many writers like yourself as well you actually work things out when you write about it, about it totally <laughs> so I'm almost like I don't know what I think until I've written it 
Yes. <laughs> Which is kind of crazy. Now, you mentioned like, you know, profit spreadsheets there. And I did <laughs> want to, um, you know, because the, and, uh, and I did say this to someone the other day, I said, well, what's your profit? Not, you know, I said, what's your P&L on, on that book? And she went, what? What are you talking about? So you actually have a, a P&L um, in Scratch, you go through one. I wondered if you would um, explain a kind of overview of what that is from, obviously, that was from a traditional perspective, but also yes. how people can assess that themselves. Yeah, so in Scratch, we ran this profit and loss statement that a traditional publisher would use, but an independent author could totally use it. Um, and what it does is it calculates up front, okay, what are all of the, my expenses going to be, like on a freelance basis and then on um, like a unit cost if you're doing print books or if you have ISBN costs, those sorts of things. You build in all of the costs up front, estimated and actual. Mm. And you can even put your hourly rate in there if you want to like you know, like pay, pay yourself an hourly rate. Um, and then you have to do some sales estimates and hopefully you can do that based on a historical perspective of what the last book did or talking with other people, what their experience has been, if they're willing to be transparent about it. And so then you plug in the sales numbers and you also calculate, you know, the discount that the retailer is getting. And then you see, okay, how much money am I going to make in, say, the first year of sales? And then you can also run it for longer. You can run it for two years or five years or ten years to get a, a, an idea of what's the potential for this book. And then it, what's really interesting, I think, is if you – in publishing, we would call it a season P&L. Um, where you would take all of the books that you were going to publish in a specific season. That might be 10 books or 100. And then you look at the bigger picture – because then you put all of your low-profit books with your high-profit books, and you see if you're hitting the right target. So an author could do that with all of the books they have planned to release in like a three- to five-year period. Um, kind of the more um, the projects maybe you know won't sell as well against the projects that are a little more um, catering to your readers or to your market that you know will. Yeah. And then see what the overall picture is. Yeah, that, that's a really good idea. And I especially like the three to five year idea or the 10 year idea, because of course, people like you say, people want money right now. Um, and the fact is, the great thing about self publishing is you get to make a little bit of money every hopefully every month for a long yeah. time, rather yes. than getting a smaller, uh, or a smaller, bigger spike, and then mm -hmm. potentially never seeing anything else. I mean, do, do you think that one of the biggest issues is the short term thinking in a across all publishers. <laughs> totally, 100% agree. Short-term thinking is one of the greatest banes of any company, publisher, author's existence. Everyone is so focused on, can I get this to pay off in two weeks or two months or even two years? Mm. And I try to emphasize in all of my talks and blog posts, like, it took a long time, even for me. Like, And I feel like, you know, I kind of do things all right. Like, it takes me a while to get the hang of it, but it, you know, it takes two years, three years, four years um, before things gain steam. And I really feel a little more comfortable or have some mastery where it, I can actually say, all right, what are the results? Mm -hmm. um, people seem to have a lack of patience and stamina to, to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not willing to, to, to let things play out. And that's why I also emphasize sustainability in whatever you're doing. Like, you don't want to burn out and in the first year, um, going down a checklist of social media activities or whatever it happens to be because someone told you to without any um, recognition of what it is you can actually in enjoy or do regularly that, uh, so that it does, you know, amount to something after three or five years of doing it and that you can feel like you can point back and say that was meaningful work, that was a good journey and I learned something mm. regardless of the results. So... Mm. Yeah, and I, re I really feel that too. I feel in the last year, I've relaxed a lot more around like launch, like I, I put out a book this week, and I, I'm kind of not even, you know, making a fuss about it. I've sent an email to my list. I'm, you know, I only just started tweeting like 
d just before we started speaking and like I'm just not that bothered anymore about the initial bit it's just another thing in right you know in the body of work as such exactly exactly so yeah you're in it for the long game mm. I'm in it for the long game mm. so I don't have to be so like anxious about did I achieve the sales goal in the yeah. first year because yeah. I'm going to keep doing it and I know that time is on my side yeah, and I, I wondered about that. Do you think it's partly the fault of big publishers who have kind of sold a dream and there's been this this kind of veil of secrecy over the reality of sales? Um, it, 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 do you think that, that that dream has now disintegrated? <laughs> I wish it would disintegrate a little more. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like to call it the myth, and I don't use that as like a, a, a judgmental word, but like as the Joseph Campbell myth, mm. like the myth of the published author who produces this book and that, that, that that's when your life, your writing life becomes sustainable, um, when you get that contract from a publisher and it releases. I, mm. By far, the most disappointed authors I meet are the ones who just had their first book release, and they, they're like, that's it? There's yeah. Nothing, like, uh oh, <laughs> um, and they don't. I mean, certainly, a first book is cause for celebration, and you like at every step of the way, you should be celebrating these milestones. But like, that's just the beginning. That's like the first, the very first uh, step into a much larger career. Mm. So, and I think publishers, um, in whatever ways they've been, they've been reticent or secretive or just kind of, I don't know, ignorant of not like sharing the realities. I don't think they've helped themselves because it also creates this antagonism like of disappointed authors or the authors with the incorrect expectations. So of course their fury or their disappointment is going to be directed at their publisher in many cases. Mm. So I don't think it benefits the publishers to, to be anything except up, up front about what's going to happen. And maybe some are, and the authors just don't hear it, you know, they have on the rose-colored glasses and they don't actually hear the conversation <laughs> in, um, in honest terms because they think, well, I'm the exception. Like, yeah. all authors think that. My book will be different. I'll get on the bestseller list. I will make a living. So I, I guess there's plenty of blame to go around for the myth. Yeah, and it's funny because I, I had a drink with an editor from a publishing house and she actually said, and I asked her, like I was showing her pictures of the portal, you know, the KDP, you know, I can see my sales. And she said, well, we, we can't do that with our authors because they're, they don't want to see the reality of their daily sales. The fact yeah. is most books do sell very few copies a day, right? You know, they very really few. do. Very few. Yeah. Yeah. Um, having worked at a mid-sized publisher, yeah, I mean, I saw the sales reports and I knew exactly what the expectations were, but yeah, there was totally this, um, cultural reticence mm -hmm. and also like rules that you shouldn't share specific sales numbers because of the trouble that could cause. Um, and it, I always found it just very unproductive all around. Um, I felt like if you could have a very transparent, authentic conversation with the author within the, within the environment of a relationship that you've already established, like between the editor and the author or the agent, editor and author, and talking about the full context of how it's, how we've come to this point, why the sales are this way. Mm. I think that's very, very good. But most publishers just, they don't take the time or they, they've been burned one too many times. So Yeah, and I want people to feel good about that. The reason why I bring it up is because it's the, it's the reality. Most books sell very few copies every day, whether you're indie published or traditionally published. Yes. <laughs> but hopefully you, that continues for a long time. You know, that's kind of the, that is the business model is, it, you know, small over time. Right. And I hope that publishing, the traditional publishing, I hope it gets away from this launch mentality. I think slowly we're getting away from that. I mean, I think the independent authors have been so good at pointing out to the larger community that, you know, not let's not focus on the first three months or six months because the real potential is over the over the career. And, I, and but publishers, you know, have traditionally been so terrible at backlist marketing and just going on to the next season yeah and they're not capitalizing on kind of the riches of the backlist there are there are some exceptions to that but I think they also have to change gears and because in you know in the digital in the digital era you know every book can be new mm. um, regardless of how old it is at the moment it's discovered 
Mm, absolutely. And I guess, you know, uh, we mentioned a little bit about rights before. Um, wh what are some of the things that you're seeing now? I mean, I, I, a lot of people are now doing Germany. It does seem to be, you know, the next thing. Um, I'm, I've got my first book in German coming out in a couple of weeks. And I, I hear a lot of indies now talking about that. And obviously, audio is just starting. It's just hit the mm. UK with ACX. What, what are some of the rights that you see, the rights exploitation, the other opportunities for indies? that are coming up now um you've hit on two of the biggest like so the audio which has i mean article after article in the mainstream media has pointed to the an immense growth in that sector so i think it's a missed opportunity if people aren't looking at that and then the translation rights because all of the other countries in the world are catching up still mm -hmm. Uh, to to the U.S. and to the U.K. in ebook sales, and there's there's a lot of I think I don't know you would know better than I probably if it, if it's the iBookstore now that has some of the some of the impressive growth internationally. I think Kobo too mm. um, in Canada and elsewhere because it has because it has the Japanese corporation behind it, so it's got that good international footprint. Um, I think what most worries me and one of the reasons. Scratch was started was to help authors be a little more aware of the long-term picture, um, financial picture for books and in terms of their contracts, because a lot of traditional publishers are really tightening up the terms and making it harder for authors to walk away. And I wish that the contracts were a little more, <laughs> this is probably hoping for the impossible, but a little more cognizant that the environment's rapidly changing and that, you know, uh, that a contract that's set for a particular time limit, like three or five years, especially if it's ebook only, I think that's, um, I think that's more fair mm -hmm. and is is better for everybody to be able to reevaluate whether that relationship or partnership should continue. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not anywhere close to that, I think. Yeah. No, you're right, and um, it is. It, it's so interesting to to be kind of in this space and knowing what you're doing. And and I get so frustrated when authors don't even read. Uh, there's a great book by Catherine Rush, Christine Catherine Rush. Yes, yes. Contract, contract terms to avoid or something like that. And it's very clear totally. in there what you should not sign. <laughs> yes, yes. Every every author needs like I feel like there's no excuse. You like need to know how to protect yourself. Mm. And then for other opportunities, going back to your original question, like. It, there's so much happening that's interesting on the serialization side, not just with Wattpad, but just in general. So it would, I think um, I, I, we're going to see a huge growth in mobile reading. Um, it just seems inevitable. So I think authors need to be keeping an eye on what services or platforms or opportunities are coming along to capitalize on mobile-based reading because we haven't even scraped the surface of that. Um, and Wattpad, I think that's 75% mobile-based reading. Um, and that's, of course, a community of predominantly young people. Um, so I, I'm just very curious to see how that evolves, because I think it's, it's going to be one of the next great things for all types of authors, being able to, to deliver their work in a, in a more um, appropriate way for, for that, for mobile devices. Mm. No, I totally agree with you. I mean, and just on the future of reading, I guess, mobile is obviously one of the big things, but um, we've seen that um, that scanning app, that fast reading app. Yes. Yeah, well, I can't remember yes. what that's called, actually, but there's that. And I then can't there's, remember, but yeah. Yeah, and then there's Google Glass, which is really mm -hmm. interesting because that kind of voice, you know, the, the heads-up display on things. You know, do you yeah. see this kind of technology changing the way we read? I don't know. It's like, I feel like the, the one word at a time going really fast to increase your words per minute, that feels, that feels so goal driven. <laughs> like, so, um, um, like you don't enjoy the reading as much. I may be very old fashioned in thinking that, but it seems to me like, but on the other hand, it, when I tried that out, it kept me very focused. Like there was no way I could like go play Candy Crush while reading if I was in that app, um, but I I think those those feel very f like far out to me as far as the immediate opportunities. I'm thinking predominantly of 
app-based reading um, in the U.S. I don't know if this is available in the U.K. yet, but Rooster uh, is, I believe, just iPhone-based. It may be for the Android, too, a way to read literature in serialized form. Um, and then I feel like there's another one that I'm missing. Um, ju juke pop serials, I can't remember if they're app-based, but there's some of these interesting offerings out there that some writers are either welcomed in, just no gates at all, you can give it a try, or you have to kind of get through some kind of submissions process. Mm -hmm. So I, at least speaking from personal experience, when I've read fiction or nonfiction on my phone, it's usually through an app. So I think mm -hmm. uh, that's why I'm really focused on what apps are being developed that are going to be helpful in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I read a lot on my iPhone, on the Kindle app. It's, you know, you think you never will, and then you start, and then it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. But anyway, um, tell us a bit more about Scratch magazine and what people can find there. Yeah, so it's a quarterly publication, and we've ha had three full issues. One's totally free. If you go back to our fall 2013 issue, you can kind of get the whole experience and get an idea of what it's about. And then we have a January and an April issue out this year. So we always have a feature interview with um, a big name writer. So Cheryl Strayed, as you mentioned, is in the most recent issue. And then we, then I usually do an, an industry themed interview with someone you may not have heard of, but has a lot of prominence somewhere in publishing. And then we do a couple personal essays each issue from people talking about the intersection of writing money and life. Mm. Um, we do a round table uh, that has a theme. So we've done web editors, um, creative writing professors, and what was the agents. other one? Oh, lit literary agents. Yeah, yeah that's yes. a great one. Yeah. Um, and then we usually fill it out with some kind of hard-nosed business stuff. So I always do a contracts piece. Mm -hmm. um, we had the P&L piece mm -hmm. in the recent issue. I like to try and explore one trend really in depth and talk to a lot of different people about it. So uh, last issue, I focused on cereals, which is why I'm kind of gung-ho on that after exploring um, that field. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we try, we try to have a balance of what I would call um, – the life side, um, how these issues can be very personal, um, and how we develop attitudes to writing and money, and then also things that are very practical and try to advance people's understanding of the economics. Mm. No, and it's fantastic, and I urge anyone who's interested in, in business, the business side of being an author, to check it out. Even if you don't want to be a, like a full-time author, it's really brilliant for, for learning new stuff. I, I really enjoy it, and I read it on the app as well yes yeah yes so yeah delivered by app or website or if you want we have a pdf an epub edition for people who prefer that yeah and, and just tell people how much it is oh it's twenty dollars per year a bargain <laughs> it is it's ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy the amount of work you guys do it's amazing so thank you for all the work you do i, I really appreciate it for <laughs> thank you <laughs> and everything would... you put out i mean it's great your blog and you know you really do offer I think a lot to authors um, which is just fantastic. Thank you as do you. Um, to, to speak about consistency which we touched on before I mean you've been consistently producing these interviews in multiple formats for several years now I think. Yeah and four, four years it's crazy. Yes yes <laughs> and like I'm sure you would say that has had immense benefit, mm. even though you're giving away the content for free, mm. um, at least this form of the content. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, we didn't even have time to touch on platform, but I know I know you have also been doing it for years. So, you know, th th I, th I think when you're a writer like we are, it is easy in a way to want to do this as well so you know it's it's a good good time so tell people your website and where they can find scratch mag online yeah um i'm at janefriedman.com and you can find my blog there as well like as my huge archive of writing advice and i have a little parody on the future of publishing if anyone wants a good laugh um and then scratch magazine is at scratchmag.net um, and we have a blog too if you go to community dot scratchmag.net so either way you'll get there brilliant thanks so much for your time jane that was great thank you